Quickly before we start, I just want to say that we are nearly at 1 million subscribers. As I'm saying this, we're at 991,000. I'd like to thank all of you so much for your support. So without any more further hold-ups, let's get on to this week's video. It is the 18th of January 1980, and people are waking up to an important bridge being missing. It wasn't from a war or a random structural collapse, but from the time-honoured tradition of maritime-induced unexpected deconstruction. In the early hours, a cargo ship has crashed into the Almo Bridge, leaving this as the aftermath. Multiple vehicles, unfortunately, have also driven off the edge, resulting in eight dead. Today we're looking at a rare thing for this channel, a disaster in the country of Sweden. Of course, it's the MS Star Clipper disaster, also known as the Almo or Tjorn Bridge Disaster. Background This is the island of Tjorn, Sweden's sixth largest. It's just off the western coast and is known for its fishing and mooring space. Connecting the communities to the mainland has always been a bit of an issue. During the first half of the 20th century, the connection was kept up via a car ferry. But just like the one we have here in South London, a Woolwich one, it was just a bottleneck and an exercise in queuing. So what do? Well, the idea was floated that a series of bridges could be built to connect up the island. A location was decided upon. However, there was one big ship-shaped problem that needed dealing with. That was the access to the seaport of Udavella. Whilst we're talking about harbour access, let me show you the story I found on Ground News. What's that, you may ask? Ground News is a tool that can help cut through the confusing world we live in, where we are subjected to the rapid spread of hard-to-verify information through social media, echo chambers created by algorithms and filter bubbles, and financially incentivised click-generating news pages. Ground News was created by a former NASA engineer and will help guide you through the complex media landscape we found ourselves in. And it does this by gathering related articles from more than 50,000 sources around the globe. This allows you to see how the same story is reported at different outlets and importantly their political biases. Take a look at this story where a seaplane collided with a pleasure boat in Vancouver's Coal Harbour. It has been covered by 29 sources and has a 48% lean to the left. If you scroll down you can see every article about this topic and compare headlines and importantly the news outlet's factuality rating and where it falls on the political spectrum. This article from CBC tells you about a number of injured persons. In comparison to this one in the National Post, which is right-leaning, it just describes what happened, not focusing too much on the injuries. You can see that the story is more reported on the left. I for one find this really useful when researching for videos, as Ground News allows me to get a fuller picture of an event. It works for me as an important tool for thinking critically and not just following one side of the political spectrum, and taking a more balanced account of events. What I really like is the blind spot feature, which allows you to check for stories that you may not always see due to having strong political biases either way. And if this interests you, and I think you will, go to ground.news slash plainly difficult to give it a try. If you sign up through my link, you'll get 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what I use to get unlimited access to all features. I think Ground News is doing important work, and I hope you'll check them out. Right, now let's get back to the video. You see, large ships found it difficult making its way to the port, but for one main route, between the islands of Calon and Almon, the exact place the new bridge would be built. Not to worry, when Krupp, the lead design company, penned the new crossing, it would be tall enough to accommodate the large vessels, giving a 41 metre clearance below, but only under the central section of the bridge. The bridge design would turn out to be rather unusual in that it would make use of parallel tubular steel with a diameter of 3.5 metres. The bridge's total length was 518 metres, making it the longest of its type in the world, at least in 1956 when construction began. So the bridge, although applauded for its striking design and uniqueness, had an issue. If I show you in this drawing, you may see it. Imagine a ship, a tall one, say like a bulk carrier, 
and let's give it a name the carpool spirit and it's 26 meters wide it can easily pass under the center of the bridge where the space between the crossing and the water level is the highest but when we move the ship to the left or right quickly it begins to foul the clearance this effectively reduces the narrow waterway even further reportedly down to a 50 meter usable wide navigational channel. It's an issue as detailed knowledge of the area is needed to safely navigate, which is not always possible for carrier vessels, as captains may visit hundreds of ports in their career. So how do we combat this? Well, it's a common issue across many tight waterways, and there is a common solution. Get a person, train them up to know the particular waterway like the back of their hand, and lend them out to ships. This person is known as a pilot. They hop aboard the ship and guide it along the waterway, which is a rather simple solution. This was what was adopted for large vessels on the way to Udavella. As I said before, the bridge's construction began in 1956, with it welcoming its first road traffic in 1960. The companies involved in the construction were Krupp and, oh blimey, Skanska Cement Jujuret. I do apologise. The waterway had no protected barriers on approach to or at the bridge, which could protect it from any stray ships. There was also no warning system for both maritime and vehicle traffic. All the Alma bridge had was signalling lights, which as we know from previous videos, leave a lot to be desired in poor visibility conditions such as heavy rain or thick fog. So now let's move on to the other character in our story, the MS Star Clipper. She was a bolt carrier, built in 1968 by Cockhams, based in Malmo, Sweden. She had a gross weight tonnage of 16,532 and a dead weight of 27,890 tonnes. She was 26 metres wide with a length of 171.9 metres. Her bridge was towards the rear of the ship and she had seven holds for cargo. Right, now we know about our two main characters, let's dig out the old bingo cards and get into the disaster. The disaster. It is the 17th of January 1980, and the Star Clipper is departing Friedrichstad, Norway, en route to Sweden. The journey is not the longest in the world, as the distance between Friedrichstad and Udavella is not amazingly massive. She sets off at 15.30. The crew are assisted out of Friedrichstad by a Norwegian pilot, who left the ship around 90 minutes after its departure. The journey along the coastline was uneventful. Near Marstrand, the Star Clipper was met with her next pilot, and this was at 23.51. He was called Kai Alderman, and he'll be the one to guide the crew along the tight waterway up past the Almo Bridge. On board the ship's bridge is Alderman, the ship's master, the helmsman, the mate of the watch, and a lookout. The pilot will be giving steering and speed commands to the helmsman, and these are checked by the mate. They passed the Winterholm lighthouse at full speed. They're roughly 1.7 nautical miles, or 3,000 metres, from the Almo Bridge, from 11 knots to 6 shortly after. Then they next passed Batobeden, further reducing their speed, now down to the lowest that the vessel can do whilst still being able to be steered. At this time, visibility was around one nautical mile. Gradually in the darkness, at least one of the Almo Bridge's lights can be seen. I say at least one because the master said he could only see one, but Alderman said he could see both lights. The ship is now making its approach to the Almo Bridge. A turn to port is made, followed by a turn to starboard in order to line up to the approach. This is a tricky S-turn, which relies on the ship's manoeuvrability and leaves little room for error. The turn to starboard increased the ship's speed. Another turn to starboard was ordered. However, the ship is positioned far too west. Whatever the crew tried to do, the ship just wasn't responding properly. To increase the turning speed, Alderman ordered full speed forward. However, the ship didn't seem to turn at all. In reality, it had, albeit barely, and by now, collision with the bridge was seeming pretty inevitable. A reversing order was sent in a final last-ditch effort to try and save the ship from crashing into the bridge, but it was not enough. At roughly 1.30 in the morning, the MS Star Clippers overhead gantry hit the left side supporting arch of the Almo Bridge. As the ship continued, it dislodged the structure, causing the bridge to progressively collapse across its central span. 
Now, luckily, no one was on the bridge at the point of impact. However, parts of the roadway had now fallen on top of the Star Clipper, disabling its ability to make radio communications to warn of the state of the bridge. Pilot Kai Alderman did have a portable radio with his equipment, but the signal was insufficient to reach anyone who could help. A lifeboat was launched and flares were shot up at the bridge from the damaged Star Clipper. The debris from the bridge completely took out the ship's bridge assembly, cutting it off from the outside world. Misty weather and a collapsed bridge do not mix. Although at the moment of impact the bridge was empty, to the horror of the Star Clipper's crew, six cars and a lorry drove off the bridge into the void. Around 15 minutes after the collision, another lorry is approaching the crossing from the mainland. Due to the poor visibility, he is rather rightly crawling along. Suddenly, in his headlights, the road disappears. Slamming on the brakes, he narrowly avoids the drop. His lorry is now blocking the roadway to traffic from the west, but it wouldn't be for another 40 minutes post-disaster until the police would block off the eastbound approach. Each of the seven vehicles' occupants, toasting eight people, would all pass away from either the impact or drowning in the icy water. The island was now pretty much cut off from the mainland, requiring the return of a crossing ferry. A lot of the islanders had jobs and families they needed to commute to. Amazingly, commissioning a new bridge would be a rather quick turnaround, and was much more crash-resistant due to none of its span fouling any of the waterway. But like with all disasters, we need to ask why did the Star Clipper become so unresponsive? The Aftermath So needless to say, an investigation would happen, which would involve interviews of all aboard the Star Clipper's bridge on the fateful night. It would become apparent that the ship was having some sort of control issue, but one main issue that pushed for criticism was that the pilot did not wait until daylight to guide the cargo ship through the tight waterway as well as not having requested a tugboat at the time. The report that was released in April 1981 also mentioned that the ship could possibly have avoided hitting the bridge by manoeuvring the rudder to port and instead ran aground south of the bridge anchorage. This could have saved the disaster, but although making some disastrous decisions, Alderman was cleared of any wrongdoing. Instead, the main blame fell on the fact that the ship had lost proper rudder control on the final approach to the Alamo Bridge. It was found that in the cold night, ice had accumulated along the starboard side, and due to this, and due to the darkness, it couldn't be seen by the ship's crew, thus dooming its manoeuvrability at the most critical point in the journey. So basically, bad decisions led to a bad situation. The emergency response came under scrutiny as well, for its apparent lack of speed, which was the actual cause of the deaths. As I mentioned before, a replacement bridge would be built and opened in November 1981. It was better in the fact that it was less crashable, which is the bridge that is still there today. The only thing apart from the memories of those that night that remains is the concrete stumps of the Almo Bridge's arches support. Now it's scale time. I reckon it's going to be a three or a four, and this is what I've got on my bingo card. Do you agree? This is a Plenty of Foot production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plenty of Foot videos are produced by me, John, in the currently very warm corner of Southern London, UK. I have a second YouTube channel, a band camp, an Instagram and Twitter or X. So check all those things out and the links will be down in the comments section below for all the other bits and pieces I get up to. I'd like to have a very, very warm thank you to my financial supporters on both Patreon and YouTube memberships. And also for the rest of you for tuning in every week to listen to me talk and watch my dodgy cartoons. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching and Mr Music, play us out please.